tonight. Uh, tonight I'll be reading out of uh, chapter 4 of uh, Dimension Lapse, my first book. And um, uh, uh, just a recap of what happened in the last chapter, uh, Jeff was being captured by uh, Rayona and his men at the facility that he met Zarkan, Zarkan at. And um, he had he had just activated the death ray on a planet called called Z um, Zabula or Zaloria rather. I'm sorry, Zaloria. <laughs> I get my own names mixed up, but it was Zaloria was the planet, and he bl just blew up Zaloria, and so that's where we are at. And tonight's question. To win a copy of my whole series, the Dimension Labs Multiverse series, um, the question is that, and it's in this chapter, they're going to a place, a planet of refuge. If you can name the planet, you can have a chance to win. Okay, and the name will be in in the next chapter. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, I have a special this month. Um, it is uh, you buy Dimension Labs, you get Dimension Labs two at half price at five five bucks. It's not actually half price, but you get it for five dollars. So you get both books for thirteen dollars. Okay, and I will be selling copies of that at the Heroes of Villains Con this weekend in Cortland. So if you're in the Cortland area, Cortland, New York. I will be at the Heroes and Villains Con at uh, 75 East Court Street. Okay, so um, without further ado, let's get started. Chapter 4. After the last particles of the planet disbanded in the darkness of space, Riona turned towards the human. He pressed another button that closed the screen doors. He raised his right index finger, nail again, and approached Jeff. More solemn than before. You don't understand me, do you, Mr. Walker? He asked. I am not a violent being, and I don't like war, but sometimes there is no other way. I am trying to do, do what is best for the Republic, like you are trying to do what is best for Teleria. I'm from Mars, not Teleria. You're a liar. Mars is a cold and barren world. There are no humans there. Something must have happened to them, Jeff said. Maybe the Tolarians attacked them. Perhaps, Rion had pondered. Or maybe you were trying to block it from your memory. Only you would know, Jeff joked. True, Rion answered as he smiled again. Release my friends, at least, Jeff pleaded with him. They have done nothing. You will all be executed in good time, he yelled, and became more psychotic, slamming Jeff against the wall and grabbing him tight around the neck. Do you know what type of atmosphere is outside? It is much like your own. It is poisonous and unbearable. What better way to kill you than to let you suffocate in a soup of noxious gas? Enough sentimentality. It's time to die. Jeff crouched short of breath as the guards lifted him and began towards the door. Isn't there any other way, Zarkon pleaded? No, Zarkon, he stated. You know the Republic is firm on such matters. Zarkon caught Riona off guard while he grabbed Jeff and used his mind to inflict pain on the two guards. Riona turned towards the commotion and Jeff grabbed his hand, firing the laser into, into his leg, which caused Riona to fall to the floor in pain. Run, Zarkon, yelled to his friends, transmitting brain waves that painfully pierced through Riona's head. When Riona was near unconsciousness, Zarkon ran behind his friends into the corridor. Riona gained his strength and lifted himself. Even though Zarkon had maimed him, he was still quite powerful. Terror flowed through their bloodstreams as they approached the hangar deck. When they entered the Rigel 4, a guard tried to grab Jeff from behind, but Zarkon counteracted his attempt by using his mind to make him fall off balance and trip. 
They entered the craft and prepared for takeoff. As Jeff fired up their propulsion system, and the ship began to propel down to the hangar deck, leaving the dome city. Several Bolarians, Bolarians chased after the craft, which left the path of blue energy behind them as the hangar doors closed. How powerful is Riona's mind? Jeff asked as they accelerated through the atmosphere, atmosphere and towards space. Not powerful enough to do us any harm once we get away from them, Zarka answered. I can feel him trying to attack my mind, but his influence is getting weaker. Thank God for miracles, Jeff barked, as the Lingward smiled at him. Dormiton, switch that red button on the panel, the one that activates the gravity control on board the ship. His friends responded to his request. Zarkon glanced at the viewing screen as they approached space. Republican ships, Republic ships closing at 79 million miles, he stated. We also have Tolarian ships closing at 120 million miles. Looks like we've outstayed our welcome on both sides of the fences, Jeff said. Zarkon, you didn't by any chance get time to have your men put the jamming device, did you? With your own coming, he answered. Their minds were probably under his control the whole time. Well done, Aunt Jeff answered. It's going to take some ingenuity and some quick maneuvering to get out of this one. Dorm, activate the dimensional transporter on my command. Zarkon, do the, sh do the shields need to be on when you travel through the wormhole? Yes, he answered. But if any ships get in the field of the portal, they will be with us on the way out. Then we'll just have to get them to come after each other. Dorm, how close are they now? Republican ships at 40,000, Tolarian at 80,000, he answered. They're activating their weapon systems. Impact in eight seconds. Three seconds passed and Jeff responded. Now, he yelled, get us out of here, Dorm. He pressed the button and within seconds, a solar flare appeared again from the closest sun intersecting with a ship's light beam and forming a wormhole which they passed through and found themselves in an empty quadrant of space. Where are we? the amphibian asked, feeling a bit dazed again. Back in Mr. Walker's own universe, Zarkon stated. Somewhere in the Orion system. We cannot stay here long. They will find us. We've got to find a place to hide and come up with a plan. I agree, Jeff answered. The Lingwitz looked at each other like their friends were insane. All this jumping in space was making them feel like they were dizzy and rolled, rolling down a hill. Are you two out of your minds, Dormton screeched? A plan to do what? How do you expect us to go up against both sides? We'll be killed for sure. If we don't do something, we're as good as dead anyway, Jeff replied. You are willing to die for the senseless war, Mildred asked. They're probably killed. They probably killed off both races already, Jeff said. What else do we suggest we do? Survive, Dormitan answered. If what you say is true, we are the last of our races and must preserve that legacy. He admired the fact he finally was catching on to the idea of op optimistic thinking. I don't intend on dying yet, Jeff said, but we can't allow Riona to go through this, through with his plans of using that death ray. Well, Midgick muttered, you can count, on, count me out of any plans you have. Well, at any rate, interrupted Zarkon, we have to find a place to hide. I'll send out a probe. He pressed a button, which launched a tiny probe into the darkness ahead of them. The computer relayed its findings to the crew of the Ridge 04. Nearest planet is Zebula. Two weeks arrival at maximum speed, it said. Oxygen, nitrogen, atmosphere. Service temperature 90 degrees at equator. Approximately 72 water. Land masses at the north and south poles at the equator. Excuse me a minute. No intelligent life forms present. 
Set course for Zebula, maximum speed. Keep shields down unless enemy shields ships are present. Jeff was curious to find out a little more about the Clarion government, so he consulted the computer. Computer, Jeff commanded. Tell me more about these Tolarians. The Tolarians evolved as a race 105 years ago, the computer responded. They are a race of genetically altered humanoid, developed from simian, human, human, and undefined alien DNA by the 21st century human Tolarian leader, Akros. Jeff digested the information, amazed to believe a human was responsible for this gross grotesque race of beings, or with the exploration of wormholes for that matter. This explained why they were able to understand English. He remembered from Earth history, one particular man had gone farther on the study of genes than others, but he found himself unable to remember his name. The other question he had was how this particular human would know anything about theories that weren't even developed on Earth or Mars yet. How did the human reach Teleria? Jeff asked. Insufficient data, and answered. What was his name? Insufficient data. What is the, what is the location of Teleria and its known defenses? Teleria is in star sector 18-905 in the Araya star system. Defense systems unavailable to this unit, my machine answered. He became impatient with the device. He began to wonder if the alleged attack on Mars wasn't a deliberate attempt to get humans involved with the conflict. They sought to rule over every planet in both universes, and the humans were just as much threat to them as Riona was. How did the Torians develop the ability to travel through wormholes? The human asked. Insufficient data, the computer evasively stated again. While Dormiton periodically monitored the scanners, Jeff consulted the computer one more time about a connection between the three worlds of Earth, Beloria, and Teleria. They were all similar in composition, but their atmospheric diff characteristics were different. Earth was mostly nitrogen oxygen based, Teleria was mainly nitrous oxide, and Beloria was mostly carbon dioxide. The oxygen was present in each of the atmosphere, but the concentration of each one was different. Something else was odd. The, the Rigel 4 received readings of a distress call from Beloria, recorded before they left the other universe. It couldn't have been a Tolarian attack because there was public sensors would have detected this. Two thoughts passed through his mind. Either the Tolarians disabled the sensors, or he suspected something was more sinister going on, and Riona was behind it. Is it possible for your plan's defenses to have a malfunction? He asked Zarkon. Not likely. The Tolarians must have attacked. No, I don't think so, Jeff said. I've got a bad feeling that someone else had something else had gone wrong. Well, at any rate, we can't turn back. Our lives are in your hands, Captain Walker, Zarkon said. He liked the sound of Captain. He always wanted his own starship to command, but not under these stressful circumstances. He only flew small scout ships that surveyed close to uninhabitable worlds that tormented the soul. He didn't realize how, how now the size of the vessel he would later command in the future that would be even larger than this one. He allowed Zarkon to pilot the craft while he slept on his, their journey towards Zebula. He had He'd been through one of the toughest weeks of his life and was exhausted. Dormiton and Miljic remained awake with Zarkon, mesmerized by the stars, and began to realize how vast space can be. I always thought that Lingward was it, Dormiton said to his lifelong friend. To think we were, the, were only one kind of animal among billions in an emptiness called space. Will we ever see home again, Miljic asked? Probably not. Once we left there, I don't think Jeff had any intentions of going back. I wonder what happened to the rest of our people. They are probably all right if they found sufficient shelter. I'm not sure if the Twarians will be back there or not, but the others are on the opposite side of the island are safe. I don't 
like this thing called war. It has separated us from our homeland and brought us out the bitterness in Jeff. Yes, I know. He used to be a lot happier. Until the aliens came. Yes, the aliens. Miljik, would it be wrong to feel anger over the loss of our friends? I think I can answer that, Zargon interrupted. If you feel the Torians are responsible for their deaths, then you are not wrong. Although it is not always advisable to fight for what you believe is right, sometimes you have no choice. This is what we call war. Why can't we just find a planet to live on in peace? Miljic asked. Because the Talarians will not allow you to do so. They'll keep on invading worlds until somebody stops them. Right now, we, have, we ha just have to bide our time until we can come up with a plan. How can the four of us defeat an empire? Screeched Milton. Well, almost woke Jeff up. He rolled over and went back to sleep. We alone cannot, Zarkon explained. But we can find other worlds willing to join our cause. Like the world we're going to? Miljic asked. No, there isn't any advanced life there. We're going there to seek refuge until we can figure out what to do. Will we be safe there? Dorotan inquired. For a while, Zarkon said. I have to work on a jamming device so the Tuarians cannot detect us. The Galactic Republic won't be as easy to escape from, however. Their ships are just as fast as this one, and we cannot hide from Rayona's powers. He knows everything about the Tuarians and the Republic's defense systems. He does, Jeff asked, just awaking from his long rest. That explains a little. Is it possible that he is a double agent? You're joking, Zarkon stated. He's the president of the council, which gives him full access to all the information, correct? That is correct, Zarkan answered, seeing his point. He also now saw that something much more sinister was going on than an attack or an inv invasion. Someone in the council lied to him, and he was going to get to the bottom of it sooner or later. You don't suppose he's used the death ray again, do you? Let's hope not, Jeff said. But it kind of appears that way. Why don't you explain to me how it works? An antimatter matter base gener generator in its base fires the gun, absorbing the amount of energy needed from a nearby sun, and then distributes it to its target, wherever that may be. It is also capable of generating a wormhole necessary to achieve this task. Again I asked the human inquiry, why the hell would you create such a thing? You people sure don't like to play with fire. They obtained every piece of information they could extract from the computers, ship's computer banks, including the location of their main control center and weapons arsenal on the planet of Toria. Zarkon did, it, did the best he could on a jamming device, but he lacked certain materials on the ship he needed, such as cobalt, to finish the casing on it. He was confident he could find it on Zebula. With the plan only a few days away, they prepared themselves for whatever animal life was that was there. Zarkon was more of a scientist than a diplomat, and was eager to study it. Jeff warned him, as well as the Lingwarts, to keep any life forms away from the ship and to carry a weapon with him, just in case the life was hostile. Dormitan and Miljic ordered to stay on board after their arrival, started getting edgy with one another after being on the ship so long. I need someone to watch the ship, Jeff explained to them. We can't afford to risk all of our lives. If there are dangerous animals, what do we do? Miljic asked. Get the hell out of here, Jeff answered, even if I'm killed in the process. What if we're captured? I don't have all the answers, guys, Jeff said. Chances are we will not get killed if we are careful. Isn't that right, Zargon? Yes, that is correct, he answered. What will this world be like? asked Stormtown. Will we be able to swim in it? I don't know, Jet said. I don't even know if we can drink the water, let alone swim in it. I hope so, Magic replied. I hope it's filled with beautiful trees and white sandy beaches, just like Lingward. 
That's very doubtful, Zarkon stated. Sensors indicate that the vegetation is limited and only in certain regions. Well, Zarkon, let's aim for one of those regions, Jeff instructed. We're all very hungry and tired. Hopefully there will be edible vegeta vegetation there. You do not eat meat? Zargon asked the human, surprised. I do, but my friends don't. Don't they eat insects like most amphibians? Their ancestors once did. Their culture has taught them that it's wrong to kill even for food. Zarkon nodded and rechecked the scanners. Two days passed since their departure from the other universe, and there was still no sign of enemy craft. They knew their luck wouldn't last forever, and they were beginning to get a little nervous. Zarkon eyed the scanners, and the Lingwards stayed alert in case they were needed. Still no sign of Zar sign of Riona, Zarkon stated. We've been lucky. What's so lucky about two days without food? grumbled Mildred. Well, Jeff said, let's not press our luck. We st was still... We still got to make it to Zebul in one piece. Once we get there, however, it will be difficult to leave without being attacked. Not if I can finish the jamming device by that in time, Zarkon added. If we have time to finish it. Besides, you even said yourself that it would not be effective against your own people. Yes, that is true. The only way to defeat him is with the mind, Zarkon said. He turned back to the scanner council. The probe sent back more information about the aquatic world. Sensors indicate that there are reptilian life forms on Zebula. Reptilian? asked the commander. Yes, reptilian. Any indication of the size and of uh, an anatomical structure? Not at this time. Send out another probe. There is only one left. If we use that, we cannot indicate if there may be life on other worlds. Well done, Jeff stated. We only have one other choice. We'll have to land and hope for the best. We'll have to, have to probably still hijack another Torian ship for supplies at some point. The two Lingworts looked at each other in disgust and disbelief, and Dormiton put his hand over his face and shook his head. That may be, good. That may be difficult, Zarkon said. They seldom travel alone. Why don't you find a hole and bury yourself deeper? shouted Dormton. Why can't we just land and hide until they're gone? We're not sure that we'll even be able to, Jeff answered. By the next morning, they were only an hour or two away from their destination. As time passed, they faintly saw the bluish-green world, slightly larger than Earth and orbiting a small yellow sun. Its two moons shine brightly towards the star as the renegade ships pass them. The two Lingworts stared at the world in wonder, and Jeff knew their thoughts were on home. They didn't want any part of the situation. They just wanted to be left alone in an environment they could live peacefully. We're coming up on Zebula now, Zarkon stated as he peered into his scanners. Reduce engines to orbital speed, the leader told the computer. It followed the order, and the ship slowed down. Any sign of enemy craft? None, Zarkon answered, a little surprised that Riona hadn't found him yet. Good, Jeff said. Prepare to enter the atmosphere. Shields on, fire reverse thrust. They approached the surface, and Jeff directed the ship towards the equatorial landmass. There were many mountains and desert regions upon the land, but he didn't see much in the way of vegetation only in scattered areas. He figured they'd better land before any Republic vessels picked them up on their sensors. They entered a canyon with a river running through it. There was some foliage along its edges in the form of brush and trees. He switched the velocity to suborbital speed and landed along the dry embankment of the river. It was a little tricky to land in such a narrow space, but he was successful. Dust flew everywhere until the ship firmly set on the ground. He turned to Zarkon once they landed. Everyone will stay on board until I say it's safe. Understand? They all nodded. Are there still readings of reptilian life? Yes, Zarkon answered. Any signs of whether they're primitive or advanced? Not at this time. 
Jeff grabbed a laser pistol, supplies, some supplies, his backpack, and headed for the main door hatch. Zarkon, he said, turning towards him. I want you to stay here with the other two. If there is hostile life out there, I don't want all of us to get killed. You can do your scientific observations after we know what we're dealing with. Luckily, we landed near a river. I'll bring back some water with me. Is it safe to drink? Yes, Zarkon answered. If I'm not back in three hours, you can look for me, but only you. I don't want our ship to fall into enemy hands. He nodded as Jeff hit the main door, main door controls. He held his laser tight as it slid open and revealed the earth-like gorge that surrounded him and the bright blue sky and the shadows that silhouetted the rocks around him. Jeff jumped out and felt the sandy soil beneath his boots. He started to follow the river embankment that flowed about six miles to the south, according to his handheld lo lo locating device. Due to the foliage in the area, he believed the world didn't appear to support reptilians such as dinosaurs. He surmised the life forms picked up by the sensors were probably snakes or lizards. That would explain why the probe didn't pick them up clearly. Uh, let me get a drink here. The sensors were designed to detect life forms, but only on the surface and not underneath. Jeff embraced the full beauty of this livable, likable world. The sound of the river was extremely tempting, and he couldn't resist going in for a swim. Setting his laser gun down and hiding it beneath his suit as he took it off, he jumped into the cold water, cold and refreshing water, completely naked. He knew he needed to be careful. But the alluring appeal of the river was too hard to resist. The river's current was just strong enough to make it difficult to stand, which didn't bother Jeff considering he was an excellent swimmer, swimming quite frequently in the artificial lakes on Mars and in the motion of Lingwort. After Jeff bathed and drank a full canteen full of it, he submerged some extra containers underwater. He put his suit back on picked up his laser gun and started back to the ship to get to the others. When he heard a startling sound up the river, the Major decided to investigate. It was as if something watched him through the woods as he dropped the canteens in the sand, raised his laser gun, threw on his pack, and headed south following the river embankment. The temperature fell around 80 degrees to him and was quite comfortable. He guessed they arrived in the spring months since the foliage was beginning to turn green. The forest nearby budded leaves and the river was so high but not overflowing the embankment. Jeff also heard the sound of the birds in the distance, but this was not the sound he listened to a few minutes before. It was a long time since he felt water that salty that wasn't salty or stagnant other than the waterfall of springs on the island. Jeff also breathed the air here easier. He found many times the air on Lingwort wasn't to his liking because it was thinner. He began to wonder why he ever wanted to get back to Mars in the first place. If his suspicions were correct, there was nothing left for him there anyway. Nonetheless, Mars was where his people were, and if he was wrong, he had to protect them from these invaders from a parallel universe. The idea was so bizarre, he had a hard time believing it. But it was really happening. If he had told Mars control mission control there was a race with a weapon that was capable of destroying entire worlds and able to travel through wormholes, they would think he was crazy. A mile down the river, Jeff came to a lake surrounded by a small jungle. The ravine got rockier and was part of a mountain ridge that overlooked the lake on its north side. Jeff climbed on some rocks overlooking the area where a waterfall flowed into it and admired the view of the rainforest for a few moments. He guessed the lake was about two miles long and the forest went on as far as his eyes could see. He could see some wreckage near the lake in a small clearing, but it was impossible to determine its identity from such a distance. Jeff also saw an ocean to the west side, as well as more mountains. 
It was a breathtaking view for a photographer would have died for. He eyed the waterfall below him and anchored his footing, careful not to slip. It took Jeff back to a time when his grandfather was still alive. He was 12 when he last saw him on the Martian base. Colonel Thomas J. Walker saw the destruction of Earth first and the rebuilding of society first underground and then on the space stations. He told Jeff the stories his father told him, stories that seem like ancient fables now. Grandfather Walker used to have a cup of hot chocolate with Jeff and his uncle and talk about the way Earth used to be before the war. None of them saw it personally, but they describe it in detail just the same. Thomas Walker asked his grandchild if he wanted a marshmallow and his chocolate to start the conversation. Yes, please, Jeff said as he smiled. His uncle and his grandfather raised him since he was eight when his parents died in the starship explosion. <clears throat> Did you ever, did I ever tell you what your great grandfather used to tell me? Thomas asked. It was in 2045. I was almost your age. He talked about how beautiful the earth was before the war, how there were great cities with millions of people. This was before he moved underground, before the airstrikes. How, how long did people live underground? Jeff asked as he sipped his hot chocolate. At least 30 years, he said, mimicking his grandfather's action. Before that, everyone lived above the ground, his uncle Clark added. What was that like, the tween asked. Completely different from here, Thomas explained. I exclaimed, I'm sorry. The forests weren't in domes, and there, were an there was an atmosphere to breathe. Were there rivers, lakes, and beaches like in the domes? Jeff asked. Yes, his grandfather continued. They were very much vaster than here. The oceans were so large that it took weeks to get from port to port. The mountains were so large they touched the sky. They touched the sky here, Jeff remarked. But you can't climb them without a spacesuit on, Clark reminded me. What about the forests? There were all kinds of forests, Tom explained. Rainforests with pine trees, jungles with vines and swamps. They were like the forests we have here, only bigger. What about animals, Jeff asked. There was every kind of animal you can think of, his grandfather told him. There were birds, lizards, raccoons, wolves, kangaroos, and giraffes. What are kangaroos and giraffes, the curious child asked. Well, Clark said, a kangaroo looks a little like a rabbit, but is bigger, has larger legs, and a pouch in its front. They used to live in Australia. What about a giraffe? Jeff asked. They have four legs like a horse, have spots, and are about 15 feet tall, Clark answered. Really? Yes, really, Thomas laughed. He never forgot about those day last days he sat with his elderly grandfather and the days he spoke about working for NASA. They built an underground base before the attacks from the Iranians, Iraqis, and Russians, and the Russians left them unsafe from nuclear fallout. Thomas Walker was born there and lived most of his life there until they built the space stations and the Mars base. The governments left unifi unified into one organization the NASA Initiative for Interplanetary Exploration, and it was from this that the Martian Space Academy was born. Lost in this world's deep nostalgia, he felt the pain of something sharp piercing into his back and then pushing him over the cliff near the raging water. He screamed in pain when he felt the sudden blow of rocks on his back and thighs. It propelled him down the waterfall, his body twisted every inch of the way, and somehow, amazingly, he survived. Falling into the lake, he desperately gasped for air. When finally reaching Kama waters, he maneuvered himself to the shore, dragged his bruised body across the sand, his arms broke, and legs ble be bleeding badly. Jeff, now exhausted, lay on the shoreline, closed his eyes, 
and slipped into unconsciousness. And that's the reading for this week. Next week we'll be back for right chapter four, chapter five. I'm sorry, can't talk tonight. Um, and uh, so the question again is, what planet did they go to to seek refuge from the Tolarians and the Federation? I mean the Galactic Republic. That's the question. I got Star Trek on the mind. I don't know why. <laughs> but anyways, the Republic, a Galactic Republic of Peaceful Civilizations. What planet did they go to avoid, avoid them? Okay, and uh, once again, I'll be at Heroes and Villains this Saturday. Come and visit my booth. I'll be there from 10 to 5. Uh, we did Finger Lakes Expo last week. It was, it was a good show. Uh, I sold a few books there and met a lot of old friends that I know from other shows. And um, we we talked a lot and had a good time. So uh, next week we'll see you with Chapter 5, okay? Bye for now. Have a good night.